on September 16th, I put out a short video talking about Rebecca Clark in preparation for an upcoming Car for Chamber Music Project concert that featured her viola sonata of 1919. The next morning, I received an email from Christopher Johnson, who is Rebecca Clark's great nephew-in-law and who spent the last nine years of Clark's life working closely with her. He disputed the claims that I had made in the video, which piqued my curiosity and interest because it challenged my own preconceptions about who Clark was as a composer, especially as a woman composer. So I emailed with him back and forth and he agreed to go on video with me in a conversation about his great aunt, Rebecca Clark, which is what you're about to see. Hello. So with me today is Christopher Johnson, uh, the great nephew in law, correct? Of uh, Rebecca Clark. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself uh, Chris and your relationship with Clark and how you got to know her and the time you spent with her Well, I've been married to one of her great nieces for just 50 years a few weeks ago. Congratulations. And uh, thank you and um, I Met her actually on our wedding trip in 1970. I'd heard all about her in advance the, the, the famous aunt the great composer the great viola player all that romance um, and of course of interest to me, she had married one of the great uh, Bach pianists. Yes. Of any James, time at all, James Friskin. James Friskin. So I had heard some of his recordings and I knew his name. And of course, all this sent me off down to the library to read up on both of them. So I was primed and ready when I finally met her. And just, well, fell in love. She was a wonderful person. She was an incredible presence. and. You you just were I'm somewhere between love and awe right off the bat, and tremendous charm as well. And we um, we lived in Atlanta for a couple of years, so she and I corresponded. She was on the Upper West Side, in Manhattan. Uh, we shared musical interests in many ways. So she consulted me about a couple of things, and then when we moved back up to New York. I got more and more involved helping her out with a steady stream of interest from bibliographers and musicologists and performers who wanted to document her work or to get access to it and perform it and things like that. And she was in her high 80s mm -hmm. at that point and had a lot of physical problems. So it was difficult for her to get around. So I gradually became eyes, ears, legs, filler out of early database forms, and you may have some awareness of how cumbersome those things were. Um, and then when I decided to pursue advanced studies in musicology, first thing I needed was a big bibliography project. And I thought, well, gee, it would be neat and would meet a lot of purposes and needs if I could do a thematic catalog of her works. So I proposed it and it was accepted and I managed to talk her into it. We did the work together and she was a little hesitant at first about getting into all this stuff and she really hated having me around underfoot in her dining room for months and months and months. But <laughs> we finally got the thing done and as we worked through it she would pull something out and look at it and say, oh, parallel fifths. And so she'd fix that. And a couple of times she came across a piece that she'd never really been happy with, or she just looked at it anew and thought, oh, I, that needs a redo. So she'd take it away and it would come back the next time I went up there, torn down to the ground, built back up in a different and invariably a better form. Yeah. And just through the fairly straightforward business of inventorying and cataloging and dating and talking and saying, who is this person and who is that dedicatee and all that sort of thing, pretty soon I knew much more about her work comprehensively and in depth than I had really bargained for. And so, um, well, that, that was done and it went in. And then after she died, um, people started 
consulting me for information about her, there were a lot of irons in the fire in her last years, recording projects, concerts, um, a reprint of the trio. And because for her uh, 90th birthday, there was a, a major concert, correct, in, in New York? No, actually, well, that was a, it was a series of separate events. Okay. Um, a local radio personality here in New York got a tip that she had been associated with Dame Myra Hess, the famous pianist. Mm -hmm. And she, Dame Myra had just died, so he was doing a memorial program about her. And he got a tip that, that there was this lady named Mrs. Friskin up on West 108th Street who knew her quite well. So he called her up and she said, well, I'd be happy to give you an interview about dear Myra, but you'll have to come to me because I can't get out and get down to you. So he came up uh, thinking she was a violinist, not a violist, named Mrs. Friskin. Apparently didn't know anything about her other than that. So they started chatting about Dame Myra. And at one point she said, well, you know, one thing that was so wonderful about Myra was she was such a great colleague, especially for composers. You know, she'd do anything for you. And she was a, a great help in getting these things up on their legs there. And he, oh, you, 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 you compose? Well, yes, here's the promotional bill for my concert of my own works at Wigmore Hall with Myra actually at the bottom of the talent list. And what, what, what year was that concert? Uh, 25, 1925, right. yeah. Um, so he was taken aback and um, went home and did his homework, actually bothered to look her up in Grove where there was a substantial entry. Uh, and he realized that her 90th birthday was coming up within a matter of months. So he planned a 90th birthday program about her. And it actually worked out very nicely. They did full length performances of the Sonata and the trio and three or four songs. Um, had excerpts from an interview with her and it actually worked out very nicely, but the, the really important thing um, was that she got connected up with a viola player named Toby Apple, who uh, was the coming thing at the moment, and they fell in love just the way she and I had fallen in love. And he really adored playing the sonata, and he was gearing up for some big concert gigs of his own, especially a Tully Hall recital in Lincoln Center. So he programmed the Sonata, and that became one of her first big high-profile performances here in New York City right. in many years. But the, the thing about it was, it got attention from outfits like the New York Times, and the Strad magazine, and then he took it over to England and was doing it on the BBC and doing it in concert. That got more and more attention. So one thing leads to another, and there she was, visible right. and present again, in the concert world, in the trade papers, in the general newspapers. And then there were all these other things as well. I mentioned a recording that was in place in her last years. That led to a recording of the trio, which is still one of the best performances ever committed to, I was about to say vinyl, you can't really <laughs> say that anymore, can you? Uh, but it was vinyl at the time, terrific performance. Um, and that created more performances and more recordings and all the rest of it. So it all kind of came out. But now it would be, based on our previous conversation, it's not quite accurate to say that she was rediscovered or that she had like oh, no. dis disappeared. No, no, she never she never disappeared. She was in all of the basic references, musicological in general, in oh I forget, six or eight different languages all around the world. No. Uh, not only the uh, Grove Dictionary, but uh Riemann's Music Lexicon, um, a whole bunch of others that I'm I'm old now myself and names escape me, but um, I went down to my local library just a while back and just pulled things off the ready reference shelf and looked up Rebecca Clark in all of them, came up with 14 
Yeah, so she was she was always there for the final. She, she, was, she was always there, and and now um, I imagine we'll go into this a little bit later about how I come by all this stuff. I've got all her fan mail. Oh, really? She, so I can, yeah, I can actually work out the chronology uh, to some extent of activity and awareness in that period. Basically, well, certainly, certainly by the mid fifties, but essentially she like virtually all the composers in her cohort in Britain and in America, all got plowed under in the post-war triumph of academic serialism. Right, because there was, it was serialism or bust for, yeah, for a it, couple decades there. Exactly, so. or die, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, anything that even hinted at tonality was, as she put it, old hat. Right, and even so she, she, had no, she had no interest in adapting to the, to the serialism wave. She was, that was not something that she was just interested in would sometimes refer dryly to the ground glass school of composition. Oh, and no, she had no interest going there, although she was astonishingly pro progressive in her own handling of tonality. Well, and, and her, her, and it, her style is rather adaptable over the, the course of her compositional career. Like it's, it's not just stuck in this Edwardian Victorian milieu. It, it has some, some progression, correct? Oh, a great Ad adaptation. Great deal, and it's set in very early. Because I, 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 in reading some of the more popular or accessible material, they, they make a big point that, well, she just stopped composing in the mid-50s, as though it was some sort of uh, giving up on, on the attempt. How, would you characterize that? How would you characterize well, that? It's ambiguous. Um, bear in mind, she was born in 1886. So by the mid fifties, she's in her mid sixties. Right, she's at retirement age. Normally, yeah, and for composers, for the most part, she's well past it. Right. Anyway, right. I mean, it's only a recent phenomenon that you get the likes of Elliot Carter going on at one hundred and four. Right. Um, but also, she had started to have a number of chronic physical problems. Decades before that, I, I also now have her diaries and have had a lot of time to go into them in great depth and detail. And really back, back in the 20s, she was starting to have physical manifestations, especially in her legs, um, that just got worse and worse and worse over time. And you know, the, the viola's an ungainly thing, even for somebody who was nearly six feet tall and had long arms as she did. So there's a, a great deal of wear and tear physically, certainly by the time she was in her mid 60s. And I think after she married James and realized so much happiness and fulfillment from that, um, it just, I, she had a lot of things to do that made her very happy that she hadn't had in her life before. And also, I think she's probably just happy to put the instrument away and say, okay, enough. I don't have to endure this physically anymore. And she, she always spoke, never in terms of inspiration, uh, rarely in terms of themes or motives. She always spoke of ideas. She, she, you'll see it in her diary. Had a great idea for the beginning of a trio wonder if I can bring it off, uh, had a new idea for a song. So it's, it's always the, the thought dawns on her and that's what spurs composition. It's not that she's hacking away at right. it all the time and whatever churns out, churns out. Um, it starts with the idea, she works with it, if it takes and if it works, she completes it or she keeps going until she's happy or whatever. If it isn't working out or if something else intrudes, it falls by the wayside. But there's no real habit or pattern to it, even at her most productive period. There's not, because bear in mind, she's also a very active, very prominent, very famous and very successful player. 
And that, that was her first, her first thing back in, back in the 1910s. She started off primarily known as a- well, No, actually it was, it was almost incidental in a number of ways. She started out wanting to be a composer. She fell in okay. love with um, odd little bit. Well, first, first of all, her, her father who was a total nutcase, uh, but he was an enthusiastic musical amateur and he wanted to have some form of chamber music going on in the home all the time. So at first he and his wife would bring in neighbors and friends and they'd saw away stuff in the, in the music room. Uh, and then he sent the children out one after the other for music instruction and pretty soon he had a string quartet on tap in the family. Um, and the kids all kind of, oh God, do we have to do that? And slaved away at it when they were forced to, but uh, Rebecca Clark uh, ultimately just fell in love with the whole thing and specifically with, not so much with the playing, but with the music. She talked about carrying around the minuetto from a Haydn string quartet that she'd fallen passionately in love with and either bought a miniature score or wrote out the score to this one little movement. And she said, I would carry it around and close the door and worship it in secret, this sort of thing. But it was, it was always the composition angle that really spoke to her and specifically chamber music. She was always geared to that. That was the focus both in performance and in composition and really I wouldn't say the only thing she wanted to do, but, but her, where her spirit really was. Right. That, that was, that was what her, her interests yeah. were. And that, and that, that brings up the whole, the whole idea of how she had so much agency in her life as, as, as a performer, as, as a composer. And I, I remember in our, our previous discussions and, and the, the video I had made previously, that kind of was the catalyst for this entire discussion that there does seem to be a narrative out there um, that seeks to challenge how much agency she had. Um, would, you, would you agree with that sort of assessment or how, how, would you, how would you characterize it? Oh, I agree that the assessment is out there and it's actually, uh, it, it has overwhelmed scholarship and popular discussion and the general understanding of, of Clark as a public figure, as a composer, as a human being. And it, I, um, well, I won't use the word that was about to cross my lips, but it's, it's um, it just not fundamentally untrue. So what, what in her lo life would you bring as sort of exhibit A, just to kind of show the agency she had? I mean, we, we've talked about like the composition of the Viola Sonata and especially its, it, its promotion after the premiere. Right, well, let's, let's start with composition as a thing unto itself. Um, somebody once asked her how she came to decide to be a composer at a time when, as this person thought, women composers were a relative rarity. And she said, well, I don't know that I ever thought about it. It was just something I wanted to do. Right. You know, just boom, like that. No, right. it, that was, it was a choice, that. yeah, and she, she went and did it. Yeah, and it was in, in a way a kind of ignorant choice because she had no direct knowledge of it as an activity. Her father took her to concerts. Of course, they had the chamber music on tap in the family. Uh, London was a great place to be in the late 1800s, early 1900s. So she heard a lot of just unimaginably wonderful stuff. So there are plenty of examples out there, but as far as doing it, it wasn't an obvious thing and it actually came about almost by accident. She had started trying to write songs on her own without any instruction, some, somewhere in her middle teens. And um, they're what you might expect. They're sort of rudimentary and stumble bomb at first and they become more proficient and more expressive as they move along, but they're still not ready for prime time by any means. And her father, who, as I say, was kind of a, a nutcase, was just constantly at her about it. 
and said, oh, what do you, what do you, what do you think you're going to do? I mean, you can't go out there and be a composer. You're never going to make a living at that. You need to get married and give some nice man a nice home. And she kept at it. She was just as stubborn as he was in many ways. And of course, it, by, by then she found her authentic self, you know, immature as it was and as the activity was. So she was determined to go ahead with it. And she just kept doing it and kept doing it and kept doing it. And you couldn't hide old music paper. So finally, he just said, well, let's see what somebody says who knows something. And he had, I'm not sure what the connection was. Um, something was said, this just may be family lore. He met Sir Charles Stanford in a railway compartment one time. And Stanford, of course, was not only a very prolific and very fine composer, but he was arguably the finest, most respected uh, composition teacher of his time, certainly in the British Isles. But he commanded a great deal of respect in Europe as well. So this is like... <sighs> I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any equivalent for it these days. So anyway, he just hauls these things off, mails them to, I'm sorry if that looked visually <laughs> frightening there. I'm not used to Zoom. Um, he hauls off, mailed these things to Sir Charles and says, my little girl wrote these things. Take a look at them. Give me your judgment on them. And how, how Assume, old is Clark at this time? Uh, so late, late teens? 20. 21 or 22, okay. Okay. I think. But bearing in mind the times, this is, this is 1907. And as she put it to me once on a different subject, oh, Chris, you have no idea how little we knew back then. So I think developmentally, her 21 or 22 in that environment is probably comparable to something like 15 or 16 today, okay. just in, in terms of, of perceived maturity and sense of one's own autonomy. So at any rate, he, he sends these things off to Sir Charles, and Sir Charles, unexpectedly, I mean, the, the father clearly thinks he's going to say, ah, rubbish, get her, you know, send her to finishing school or something. Get her married. <laughs> yeah, whatever. Uh, Sir Charles, does his job, looks at them on New Year's Day 1908, no less. The man's off work. He looks at these things and says, um, there are some real signs of talent here. Uh, a, a, a true melodic gift and, um, how does he put it, a fine independence of idea. And he also take note, takes note of her um, rhythmic sense. So right there, just on the basis of a few of these child's work songs, he's basically perceived the essential elements of her entire- Her later album. style, yeah. Exactly. And all of this, so not only a great teacher, but a, a, a profoundly insightful musician. And these things, and he said, uh, "Now, of course, it's a it's a difficult road to hoe. It's a hard life. Things don't always come easy. Things don't always come in the form you want them. There are frequent dry spells, great deal of frustration and disappointment, no assurance of material success in all of it. In fact, every expectation that you will not have material success from composition." But if you think she's up for that, I'll be happy to try my hand at teaching her and we'll see where it leads. Two weeks later, she's walking into his studio hmm. as one of his first female students. Now, this is, um, I don't know. I mean, in, in context, it's almost like being invited to heaven to study theology with God. You just... Right cannot do better than that. This is, high, this is as high as you could get for it, a composer of any, any could, gender, any kind. This not was, do better. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Right. And also, just as a, as a matter of strategy, not that she ever thought about this, and I don't imagine he did either, uh, 
This is the very time when a lot of currents are, are all coming together in the British Isles, where they're consciously moving. This is the real British musical renaissance, the, right. the, the juice behind it. Everybody's just had it up to him. Mendelssohn was resident in England and highly favored and vastly influential because Victoria favored him and all that. So everybody followed that model for a long time. And after, you know, by the time Clark got into it, everybody's just sick to death of the whole thing. So they're looking for all kinds of ways that they can pick up on real, authentic, native, spontaneous, to them, natural modes of expression and forms and, and deviations from form. And it has often been portrayed as kind of a fuddy-duddy and a, and a boring textbook kind of guy. Actually, this flaming subversive in many ways, and he's fostering people in all kinds of original approaches and original utterance. And he and Clark just take to each other like, uh, I, well, I don't know what, I can't come up with a simile, but they, they liked each other right off the bat. And the difference between what she went in with and what she was producing by the end of that first year. Night and absolutely, day. At night, and, night and day. I mean, the, the, the improvement is phenomenal and already there is, well, you can, you can see her full voice there. And into the second year, She's doing something that are still kind of cutting edgy today. They're so original and the sound is just so uniquely hers and so mesmerizingly special. And he, of course, is fostering all this stuff. But you see, it, it all came about by accident. She right. was uh, probably expecting to be a violin player. She started out playing the violin and then developed this interest and then almost by accident on a on a dare really she winds up studying composition with the guy at the top of the field right here and it works brilliantly for her and evidently for him he went to great lengths even after she left the royal college to move her along and help her out so because she never finished her um, full term of study there correct well, again, the father was right. a nut job. And so, and, um, um, so you've brought the father several times. And I know in some, I think, excessively psychological interpretations of Rebecca Clark's life, the father figures pretty prominently. Um, how did Clark characterize her relationship with her father? Well, he, we're, and a little bit, when she had to leave the Royal College was when he had a fight with her that had nothing to do with music and threw her out of the house and said, never let me see your face again. And her mother, who was a completely different kind of person, very level, loving, supportive, intelligent, stable, um, a beautiful parent in many ways, um, her mother said, I always knew it would come to this by implication, given who right. and what he the is. The personality of her father, yeah. Um, it is better for you if you go. So she helped her go. She helped her on the sly after she left. But um, there she was out on her own. And she had to go back to the college, not as a student, but as a hired player, extra player in the college orchestra. Um, but he, and I'm sorry, I've lost track of the question here. So ju just characterize how she characterized her relationship with her father or how, in, in later life and memoirs. No, he was, I mean, a, he, was, he was very domineering and very intrusive when he paid attention at all. all right. Uh, so they they were 
they butted heads constantly. As I said, she was just as stubborn and self-willed as he was, albeit immeasurably healthier. Um, so in a way, it was a merciful deliverance. I mean, he, he, he had pushed her out temporarily a couple of times. Oh, you need to go and do it on your own for a couple of weeks uh, in France, just to remind you what a good home you've got. Or one time she did it in London and discovered it was actually more convenient. Right. Because he could, uh, at that point, she was at the Royal Academy, not the Royal College, studying the violin. And she said it was it was just easier to get back and forth. You know, I so it, 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 train it, ride out to Harrow. Uh, it was fun to drop into little shops and get my meals there. It was great. I loved it. It was wonderful. So she'd already learned there was a world elsewhere. Which also speaks <laughs> to, her, to her own sense of agency and, and drive and ownership of her, her life and, and choices in a way. Yeah, I mean, it was, a, it was a big scary thing. All of a sudden, boom, there you are. Uh, you've only got the clothes on your back, your viola, and what did she have? I think 14 pounds in a post office savings account. But she had friends. She had her desk mate in the college orchestra, and she went to her, and she said, hey, stay here for a minute. Here's a cup of tea. She went around the corner and arranged a room for her over the shop around the corner and she said, it's cheap, you can come here for your baths and now you need to turn around and go to the Royal College and see if you can get a job. They always need extra viola players. And that's what happened and pretty soon she was hiring out for chamber gigs here and there. She's making her own way. Pretty soon she was in a position to borrow a little money and get an upright piano so she could start composing. Uh -huh. And within two years of being thrown out of the house on her own, she's playing in high profile private venues with the likes of Pablo Casals and Arthur Rubenstein on a fully equal basis. Which is remarkable for anyone, regardless, regardless of background or, or, or gender or, or any of that. So, um, which, which, which brings up the, the measure of her quality. Right. And the fact that the, the musical culture at the time, the professional culture, and the, the, the people who funded these things had the wit, had the knowledge to recognize her quality and her ability, and she was able to sustain it in fast company like that. Right. And so we could just make sure you touch on this for the sake of time. Uh, so did Clark, how did Clark view herself? Did she view herself as a woman composer? What was her approach to that sort of term? Did she talk about that in her own writings or...? Well, she didn't go on about it, but she did a good deal of lecturing and public speaking and broadcasting later on. And uh, the topic naturally came up. Uh, and at one point in an interview with, I think it was the Christian Science Monitor at one point in her most prolific period, um, they asked her the question and she said, I would rather be known as a 16th rate composer than to be known as a woman composer and only that and it wasn't that she disdained women she was she was <laughs> a fantastic woman and she was very proud of it and she gloried in it um but and she did a lot to support and to promote other composers who happened to be female but she was a composer first and foremost the gender was incidental as far as she was concerned. And I think she didn't want to be conceptually ghettoized. And she especially didn't want, um, well, actually the two sides of the same coin. She didn't want special pleading because that was demeaning. It basically said, my stuff's not really that good, but because I'm a woman, you need to give it extra credit and she, she she spoke and wrote about that that particular perspective yeah herself she and and she said at one point you know sometimes you can benefit from it it at, at one point in the 20s or 30s she said it seemed like it got to the point where uh our stuff she was talking to an audience of women our stuff got programmed more often than perhaps it deserved which of course is more fun for us than the other way around, but it's still not ideal mm -hmm. there. 
so she she didn't want to be devalued by the special pleading. And at the same time, she understood perfectly well from direct experience that programming things explicitly and in a limited exclusive way as woman composer, you know, a, a, a concert of woman composers or it's woman composer week or whatever, it kind of forces people to experience it in that light primarily or exclusively. So it's almost asking people to come in and say, oh, it's woman composer stuff, it's um, characteristically female. Um, they might not ever conceptually think of it outside of that venue. And especially as, as one prominent London critic observed at one point, you know, if you program it and publicize it and invite people in to review it on that basis, then in all honesty and professionalism, the judgment must be executed on that basis. You really, if you were asked to look at it as the work of a woman composer, then you're almost forced to assess it on that basis. Now, the truth of the matter is, once she started um, performing her own stuff, and especially once she started publishing it, naturally, I mean, it's a, it's a newsworthy item. Right. Um, so people did mention it, but overwhelmingly, you, I, I can't offhand think of more than one or two examples, and they weren't in prominent places, uh, where a critic or a reviewer said, um, oh, just like a woman, or pretty good for a woman, or something like that. More often, if they deal with it at all, which by and large they don't, they just say, oh, Piece X by Rebecca Clark. This is what we, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's it. If it weren't for the personal pronouns and the name Rebecca, it would be just like anything else. Right. Uh, and, but, but there are some, especially when the big pieces start being published, where um, a lot of the more extended reviews will say something like, this is not just good for a woman, this is good, period. You need to pay attention to this on its own merits. She is a fine composer, regardless of any trait or any other extra musical yeah, association. And yeah, well, you know, it's it's that old double bind. I mean, just as you can't promote women composers without kind of faintly ghettoizing them in a way, you can't disarm a vague general prejudice that you can only expect so much or you can only expect a certain type of thing from a woman composer without naming the prejudice. Right. You know, you, you can't address it without using the word. And it's deeply anachronistic and really kind of unfair to everybody involved for us to come along a hundred years later and apply the language usage standards of our time and say, oh, sexist language. Because, oh. because when, you, when you look through some of the literature of the suffragettes in the early 20th century, so is it, it's a similarly, it's a similar thing. Like we're, we're good enough to be received on the level of men. Is it not? Is it, oh, is it the same it, sort of gender, gender informed? It, it went beyond that. The word virile was one of the strongest positives a woman, a woke woman could give to another woke woman. I mean, the, the, I've, I've spent a lot of time reading Votes for Women, which was the flagship publication of the suffrage movement up until they got the vote. Right. Finally, it went out of business. But it, it really is just remarkable. I mean, everything that today is cited again and again and again as an example of men demeaning Rebecca Clark and her compositions on a sexist basis are exactly the things that suffragists said as the highest praise about their fellow suffragists, and specifically things that they said about Dame Ethel Smythe, a composer and a 
famous, you know, uh, hero. Now, and you, you, I, now you, you brought up uh, Dame, Dame Ethel, and she and Rebecca Clark did have a meeting at one point, correct? <laughs> Actually, which is, which is a fascinating story, I, had, as I recall. Well, they had, they had several. Um, first of all, well, sev several things about Dame Ethel. She has this blinding reputation. I mean, just, just as Clark is largely portrayed as this suffering sick, sad, depressive Phoebe in most of the literature these days, Dame Ethel is this great titanic right. hero of feminist striving. And in fact, she explicitly blew off the whole suffrage movement for years until she finally developed a personal relationship with one of the leaders of the movement. And then she said, oh, okay, I'll give it two years off from my composition. I'll, I'll devote two years to suffrage, pure and simple. Well, of course, at the same time, she's pursuing this personal relationship as well. So the two met in the middle there. And then after the two years was over and the relationship shifted, she was out of there. She had nothing further to do with the suffrage movement. Um, she. This, this, was, this was Dame, Dame Ethel's smile. Dame, Dame, right. Dame Ethel, uh, before all this. She only once in all of her copious writings mentioned a female composer, not herself by name. She did virtually nothing to promote specific female composers. She's and, always full of complaint about the problems that face women composers comprehensively across the board, but she never did anything at a practical level to actually promote one of them. And that, anyway, that contrasts pretty markedly with Rebecca Clark. I mean, because she had a, an all-female piano quartet and, and did extensive work with, with other women artists at the time. Well, that, was, that was somewhat later on, but oh, her right. first gig was with an all-woman string quartet. And she was uh, commonly associated, well, there were, there, there were a lot of women heavy or all-women outfits of all kinds. I mean, they were running riot in England at that point. They were all over the place in many ways. So the very idea that there was anything unusual or subversive or weird about women in almost any of these professional areas, again, it's just factually erroneous and profoundly anachronistic and mostly a matter of people reading what seems self-evidently obvious on a common sense basis looking yeah. back a hundred years. Rather, rather, rather than the actual... Than actually reading the newspapers and seeing, or looking at the display ads on the entertainment pages and see what was actually going on. There are women all over the place. My God, Rebecca Clark, no, there was no question about her going out and earning a living. Opportunity from here to kingdom come. She walked right into it. The field was ready for her when she went out there. But at any rate, to get back to Dame Ethel, um, she, uh, Clark gave a recital in London. I think she may have played her sonata, one of the billions of times she played it herself. Um, and Dame Ethel was brought back and introduced to Clark, not the other way around. So the, you know, the-, the there's, there's already the, an odd sort of power the, dynamic. Yeah, it's a, little, it's, a, it's a funny little thing and not what you would expect. And then um, sometime later, and I, I know this out of Clark's mouth, I don't have documentation for it, so I don't know exactly when this was. Um, they were at dinner in a country house. It was probably one of those, you know, Masterpiece Theater, right. BBC country weekends or something. So they're sitting at dinner, and of course, Dame Ethel's there, and Dame Ethel dominated every conversation she was anywhere near. So she's carrying on about women composers and sufferings and problems and her own titanic struggles and all the usual thing. And finally, she looks down the table and she sees Rebecca Clark sitting there quietly spooning her soup up. She said, and you, Miss Clark, you must also have experienced the same kind of thing. And Clark, said it was, it really was kind of comical because she kept trying to turn the topic because she thought if I give her an honest answer, it's something she's not going to want to hear and I don't want to embarrass her. So she, she kept trying to make 
little palliative remarks and whatnot. And Dame Ethel just kept pounding away at her. No, 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 you have to tell us, you have to tell us. And finally she said something mild like, well, actually, you know, on the whole, I think I've had a pretty good time of it. I don't think I've had any uh, particular problems and actually have had a pretty good ride. And of course, by the mid twenties, that was absolutely true. You know, her name was all over the newspapers yeah. and she's published elaborately all over the place, all over the BBC by then. Um, and Dame Ethel just reeled back. And then look, she had this really formidable nose. Clark said she drew herself up to her full height, stared at Clark down her nose for a minute, and then said, oh, well, you have sex appeal. And it, you, you see the implication. Yeah. If, if you didn't have the same problems that I see confronting all women composers, you must have vamped or even slept your way to wherever you've gotten. And the, the insult was so breathtaking that she said it just silenced the room. Mm. No, nobody knew what to say. Um, she, she did mention this in a much more genteel, tactful way in one of her um, speeches later on. But ironically, in 19... I don't remember, but, but later on, um, Dame Ethel invited her out to her house in Walking, and uh, they sat around and talked music, and Dame Ethel was interested in hearing some more of Rebecca Clark's stuff. So on the spot, Clark had to sit there and play and sing some of her songs. Yeah. And she said, awful performance, but she seemed interested. Mm -hmm. And then they had tea and then Dame Ethel walked her back to the train station and all that sort of thing. Later on, Clark went to some trouble to try to set up an opportunity for Dame Ethel to meet uh, Elizabeth Spray Coolidge, who was Clark's only real patron. Uh, that never came off, but at least she tried to make a reciprocal right. gesture on all of it. And the interesting thing, and it gets us back to uh, a bigger topic here, and the one that I think you're principally interested in, uh, 1933 going into 34, Dame Ethel's hitting her 75th birthday, and people are talking about a big festival to put on a lot of her big works and celebrate the birthday and honor this great figure in British music and all that. And Dame Ethel does what she does best. She cranks out a book length piece of PR um, with all of her views and random tributes to the suffragist figure that she had the crypto affair with back when. Um, and all that, but she has this long essay called Female Pipings in Eden, where she lays out this list of the essential hurdles that stand in the way of women composers. And she makes this ringing statement. It's all italic, her italics from the beginning. And she says, mark this truth. As of this date, 1933, there is not a single middle-aged woman existing who has ever received a full musical education on the same basis with men without any effort on her part since music was. Which, yeah. which is immediately refuted by Clark's own history at the RCM. Well, do the math. By 1933, Rebecca Clark is 47 years old, yeah. I think. Well known to Dame Ethel. Most of her life's work already done and readily available, or at least known to the broad public, highly praised and a great deal of it published. She's in her high 40s, clearly middle-aged by contemporaneous standards. And yet here's Dame Methel making this sweeping pronouncement as if Clark didn't exist or her experience didn't matter or her record was unknown to her. And then all of this stuff, you know, it, I, it made whatever impression it made in some time. She did get the festival, she did get the performances. 
she did get the lavish public subscription to fund it all as a result of the book promo there. But in our own time, all of this material was picked up and recycled without clear attribution. And it has become the basis for um, all of the work that's associated with a scholar named Marcia Citron in our own time, which has completely colored and largely determined most thinking, most research, and most popular understanding of women composers. Well, it's put forward as a model basically for all women composers in all times at all places. Right. So and, that, that, sorry, go ahead. Well, again, in, in that literature, starting in the late 80s and, and really coming to a head uh, with two publications in the 1990s, Clark, again, essentially disappears. She shows up as a couple of passing supportive anecdotes, just a, a sentence or two each time in this much larger document. And every statement that is made in this watershed paper and the book that followed it, that are now like gospel in musicology, every single statement as if of fact that is made about Rebecca Clark in those two sources is factually incorrect, some of them grossly incorrect, and all of them in a misleading way. Part of it is this, this big idea about Clark that she had to hide her identity and even hide her own work under a pseudonym. Which only happened once, correct? On the, one time, yeah. one recital. And it was, it was her choice just for basically well, it was layout the, and PR. Well, this was her New York debut as a player. Um, it wasn't technically her New York debut as a composer, but it was her first big high profile right. appearance in that role. So it's a, it's, a, it's a double first or near first in many ways. And also she was one of the two headliners in the recital. And if you look at the, the promotional bill or the program, and they do these things with these big medallion portraits mm -hmm. of, of the two principals there, it's May Mukley, the great British cellist. She's mm -hmm. not well known or a familiar name today, but in her time, she was up there with Casals. She, in fact, she was promoted as the woman Casals. And she figures prominently in Rebecca Clark's own performing history. Well, they were, Clark first met her on that first um, quartet gig that she went out on and they became friends immediately. Yeah. And then they were closely associated. Um, a, a, a lot of Clark's works involving cello were written for Mukley or with Mukley mm -hmm. in mind. Uh, Mukley was actually the connection between Clark and Mrs. Coolidge. Okay. So there are just connections all, all over, over the place. place. And they were, they were friends for the rest of May's life. And know? so, so on, on this recital was when she used, the only time she used a pseudonym to go with one of her. She used a pseudonym, but the, but the reason why is more nuanced and actually far more interesting than uh, the bump gives it credit for. Um, Mukley is the, is the headliner. She's the well-known thing. This was, I think, her third North American tour. So this is like, oh, the great one returns. Right. And here, here she's got this, this, this great new viola player. And bear in mind, especially in America, the viola is still this exotic, right. unheard of thing. A lot of the early reviews of Clark, uh, both as a player and as a composer at that period are, wow, you know, even heard at this substantial length, the viola is not a boring or horrible <laughs> instrument. So it's it's not so much wow woman wow woman. wow it's it's the viola that it can play all this stuff. Clark writes the piece. It's damn the viola's not bad. You know by the way that music's really good too, and she's a yeah. great player. Wow, gorgeous tone out of that thing. You know so that's that's the focus on the thing. But anyway, to get back to the Aeolian Hall recital, here you've got this this promotional bill, the handout for the thing. You got the big medallion portraits up top, May Mukley, Rebecca Clark. And then they go down through the program and I forget all the details, but you've got Mukley, Clark, 
up here. And then you get down into the list of repertoire and you've got something, something Clark, something, something Clark, Clark, something Clark, something, something Brahms at the end. Well, Clark looks at it and she thinks, my God, it looks like a Rebecca Clark vanity recital or something, or, or God knows what else, what can we do? So um, she had three of her own pieces on the program. Um, the two of the duets for violoncello um, and Morpheus. Morpheus was on the program too, yeah. Now famous, but then this would have been its first public performance. So what she does is she lumps together the two duets and just gives herself a single credit, lullaby, grotesque, Rebecca Clark. And um, then when she comes to Morpheus as part of her solo group, she solved that by making up a name for the composer. She ascribed it to one Anthony Trent okay. out of the Trent River in England. And she always liked the name Anthony. So she just put them together. And there it was. Morpheus, first performance, Anthony first Trent. Trent. Well, um, some of the reviewers fell for it and said, oh, we, well, actually, one, one, only one reviewer fell for it in a significant way and said he must come next year, knowing nothing about him. Uh, the other reviewers either uh, didn't have anything complimentary to say about the piece, or they just noticed that it was there. Also included Morpheus by Anthony Trent. Okay. No judgment. Um, but everybody who did comment uh, as a matter of opinion on the pieces involved praised, sometimes quite lavishly, the two pieces that had Rebecca Clark's name on it, and either ignored the piece that had Trent's name on it or said it was a lesser piece or otherwise just said something faintly negative about it. So out of this, Clark gets great notices as a player, fine notices as a composer. Trent gets either nothing neutral or negative or a faint negative yeah. as a composer. But because, and this, this just shows you how slipshod this stuff can get. Clark herself had a clipping from an article that came out a couple of months after the fact in Vogue magazine with a drop dead glamour shot of her at the top of the column and farther down uh, some sort of airy fairy thing about um, British composers and here are all the ones that we need to hear more from. And in a list of five or six people is Anthony Trent. Now, no, you know, no praise for Anthony Trent, no comment about Anthony Trent. Right, just, yeah. And then in the caption to the photograph, it's just Miss Rebecca Clark, who recently gave a, a prominent recital uh, with May Mewkley in Aeolian Hall. Yeah. Well, this is clearly, uh, they don't do this so much anymore, but it used to be you'd get the first page of a big article in a magazine like that. And then it would be continued somewhere later on in the magazine. And then if it went on more, it'd be continued farther on mm -hmm. there. So the one thing that people saw over many years was this one column out of the middle of a larger story that Clark actually had in her press clippings. As far as I know, uh, until I went over to the library at 42nd Street back before the libraries were shut down and looked at the Vogue archive online at the whole story. Uh, I think there was maybe one other researcher years and years and years ago who had actually seen the whole story. And it's a whole different thing. It starts out with this full page blowout coverage. It's a, it's a wrap up of the whole season. It was just over high points of the season. Oh. So they got these great big glamour shots of three opera superstars out there. They babble on about them for a while and then continued on page 
5,280. This sort of thing, so you go back to that, and there's the picture of Clark, the little thing about Anthony Trent, and then continued on page 10,460s, go back to that. And here's another drop-dead portrait of May Mukley tied into the same concert. Um, and both of these photographs, by the way, they're, they're by two different photographers, but they are both of them in their time. So eminent, so top of the line. Again, there's no equivalent for these people today. Annie Leibovitz doesn't even come close hmm. to the, the grandeur and the glamour that these two guys commanded in their time. And these are they're breathtaking art portraits yeah. of, of Clark and Mukley here. But you finally get back to the last column there, and that's where the business is, end of it is, for Clark. Uh, they, they do a little short account of the recital and all of the things in it, and they say, we must also not neglect the picturesque pieces of Miss Clark, which were very fine, and he names them lullaby and grotesque, and of course, picturesque is not a diss because lullaby, grotesque, that right, is they're... literally picturesque. Right. You know, it's exactly the right term for it. And he says good things about it, plus it's coupled with these two glamour shots of the two. So between them, May and Rebecca have fully half of the pictorial interest, leave us not forget, in vogue. In vogue, yeah. Yeah, where pictures are everything. Pictures are everything in vogue. Yeah, and she winds up with this little bouquet at the end, and then he says, um, and uh, uh, well, I forget the word that he uses, but he passes off the Anthony Trent thing with just the one word. Well, hey, there she is in the world's leading glamour magazine with a glamour photo, relatively massive coverage on an equal level on strict parody with these three opera superstars up here in a highlights of the season write up. Right. It's, it's, it's a huge deal. Ask for better than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Uh, but this gets all configured as, oh, well, uh, the critics uh, dismissed her pieces and favored Anthony Trent. See, they're on the same page. And she just gets a picture when he gets a write up. Well, all he got was his name. Right. It's, it's, yeah. And if you actually read the whole source, it's a very that, different thing. That gets us to the topic of sources. I, I, I want to close actually with this, this question. Um, for anyone who's interested in getting acquainted with these firsthand sources about Clark, how can they go about doing that? Well, it depends on what you mean. If you mean um, the manuscripts and her own papers and documents, those are largely in my hands. Right. Um, after her death, her heirs assigned all right title and interest in all of that to me uh, because I'd done the work and was expert in it. Um, so you would apply to me through her official website. And what, what is her official website again? It's called RebeccaClarkComposer.com. Oh, oh, right. um, and that's the only legitimate path of access. Okay. And you can, you, there, there are contact pages there. You just, you know, write in, tell us what you want. And, and in, in well, terms of getting, getting acquainted with uh, things like perhaps the, for research sake, the, the diaries or um, her memoir, is that also handled through you and the website or how, what's, what's the access for that? Anything, well, the rule of thumb is anything that has not been commercially published is almost certainly uh, my possession and under my control. Right. And uh, the, 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 I mean, the memoir has been published or has not been published? <laughs> it's unpublished, but not for lack of trying. I've been right. promoting that thing since 1982. So the, the, for, to, to view the memoir, people would, would simply contact you and, and, sure, and go from there. Sure, here's the contact page on the website. Uh, there, there are several pages of guidance there as there's an outline of what's on offer through the website, ultimately from me. Uh, there is guidance to all the published works. So, you know, for that, you'd go to your music the publisher, right? to the yeah. publisher. 
uh, similarly for rights in them, if you need that. Um, and what else? There's a, a general guide to uh, literature that is fact-based and reliable, which rules out a lot of it, including many of the uh, primary sources. The article in the current edition of Grove, for example, is highly misleading and incomplete and about uh, 20 years out of date, especially with regard to what's published and what's not. Right. Well, yeah. So there's, at any rate, guidance provided there. But in, in any case, it's a good rule of thumb to assume that for virtually all of Clark's works, there is an extant copyright somewhere in the world. Right. So the best thing to do is to ask. Right. Uh, if you want to go to the website, and, and I emphasize that website, not any other that may bear. Right. And we'll, we'll, we'll put um, <laughs> the Clark composer .com in, in the description of this video when we, when we put it up. Please so please people, please people please watching please. can click, just click straight through that. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, a, there, there's, I mean, people, general civilians are always comp, uh, copyrights complicated. Right. Well, yes. Yes, it is. Fundamentally very simple, but people make a nightmare out of it. And at any rate, it's always good to get guidance. I'm happy to provide that. Okay. I say forthrightly and unashamedly, I know more about that than anybody else on this planet as it affects Rebecca Clark. So right. your... use the website, come to me, I will tell you the truth and help you get to where you want to get. Great. Um, by and large, if it's published, go to the publisher. If it's unpublished, go to my website and ask about it and you know we'll see where we can go. There are some major manuscripts, um, three big pieces in the Library of Congress. Uh, there are three smaller but still significant manuscripts in the Royal Academy of Music Library in London. The Britain Pears Archive um, in England has a couple of vocal duets. And there are one or two other things in private collections or in university libraries, but those are all alternate or secondary versions or manuscript copies or whatever. Um, by and large, if they're are multiple manuscripts in Clark's hand. I have the one that Clark kept through her life and had right. in her possession at the time of her death. And broadly speaking, those are the ones that have authority. So great. Uh, well, again, the place to come is is come to me. Come to right. Papa. <laughs> well, we'll, well, well, for sure, we'll for sure put a, an easy, easy, easy path for that for anyone watching this that wants to to get a handle on those firsthand sources. So, thank you so much for for taking the time to do this. It's really well, been a pleasure. Thank you for asking and, me. It's a real pleasure. And it, and it's fascinating to get this bigger picture of the, this world surrounding Rebecca Clark. So, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. What I loved about the entire process of corresponding and conversing with Chris, besides his extensive knowledge base in this area, was that it underscored the importance of constantly pursuing a fuller and more complete perspective on history. Because the study and teaching of history is ultimately a pursuit of truth, not to redeem or fix the past, but to more fully comprehend the present and thus be equipped as a community to craft a more just future. So if you have enjoyed this program, I encourage you to join with us to create more content like it by donating or subscribing to the Carver Chamber Music Project at www.carvercmp.org. Thank you very much for listening, and we look forward to catching you again on our upcoming programs.